You were looking at 16-year-old teenagers in 1966 from Webster Groves, Missouri. I'm David Hoffman, documentary filmmaker, and I worked on that documentary back then. And I'm going to show you clips from it now because this is a subject that so many of you, my subscribers, are talking about. The 1960s, growing up in the 1950s. I want to go back to the 1950s. The 1960s destroyed America. Well, Webster Groves, the documentary that you just saw a piece of and you're going to see other clips from, is really a way to look at those baby boomers who didn't participate in the 1960s, at least not in 1966. So this is another view of that era of the baby boomers, not the baby boomers who rebelled, the 30-some percent, but the baby boomers who didn't. Webster Groves is a town of about 30,000 people, way rich, right smack in the middle of the country, picked by a brilliant filmmaker, Arthur Barron. So the issue that Arthur Barron wants to look at is conformity, is the traditional ways that 1960s baby boomers were being raised. And CBS says, okay, do a test, do a trial, do a survey. We asked all the 16-year-olds at Webster High to answer a 36-page questionnaire designed by University of Chicago sociologists. That gave us exact knowledge about our subject and a scientific basis on which to plan the filming. So what you're about to see are the results of that survey. And remember, this is traditional America. This is a place where most everybody wants to conform, where conformity is really important. So here we go. Here's the results of the survey. 90% of the 16-year-olds in Webster Groves wanted to live in Webster Groves until they died, and they wanted to live like their parents did. Well, I, I'm satisfied with the conditions that I'm living in now. And, uh, well, we, it's, it's really hard to say. I, I'm content. I live in a nice house and I'm doing all right. See, I'm very, very happy. I don't, I don't have much that I can complain about. I'm perfectly happy the way I am. And until I become unhappy with my present situation, I feel this is the way that I'll stay. 75% of the teenagers, the 16-year-olds in Webster Groves, wanted money and a good job. They felt that was extremely important. Well, I think that my main goal is to become financially a success, and by this I mean that so I can support my family handsomely and have two cars, have a uh, home, two-story house, and have sort of a high status with my friends. I don't want to be, uh, you know, just dig a ditch for the rest of my life. I want to be successful. Uh, a lot of people say that they just be successful doing anything. Well, that's true. But I, I'd kind of like to make some money in my life. I mean, being quite honest. The kind of husband I want, he has to be able to support me because I've already picked out the house that I want to live in. It's right, it's right across the street from where I live now. And I just love it. It um, has four bedrooms and it's a split level. When the survey asked 16-year-olds in Webster Groves, what scared you? What worried you most? What would you think? Well, it was grades. To get a good job, they feel they must go to college. To reach college, they feel they must pass every test. To pass every test, a majority affirms, they will do anything. Too many people have pressures of, of school and from their parents to get these grades. The grades become all important. They have to get it. It's a drive. It's, it's not so much that they understand what the drive is. It's just that they've been told, this is what to do. And to many people, the pressure is just too much. They have to cheat, they feel, to, to get the good grades, to stay up with, with whoever is ahead of them. 54% admit they have cheated in order to pass a test. For the last five years, at least, the, the whole thing, everything that I've done has been geared to being accepted into a college because Son, if you don't go to college, you're not going to be anything in life. And oh, sure. E each each par the parents of each individual child are going to be proud if the student makes uh, A pluses all the way through and gets accepted to uh, some fantastic university. They're going to be proud. And on the other hand, they're going to be also be disappointed if he, if he doesn't. How did students maintain these grades? Tons of homework. Practically every school in the country will say that you should spend an absolute minimum 
of two hours studying for every one hour that you're in class. I say three. From my own personal experience, from having watched several students go through college. 48 hours of study a week, then, that you're going to have to do compared to the 13 that you're doing right now outside of school. You have to add to this the 16 that you're in class, and at least another six, possibly even 10, for laboratory work and other work outside. At 74 hours a week. Most communities in America, in the suburbs, had kind of elites. They were usually the athletes, the good-looking ones, not the academics, but the one popular ones. And Webster Grove had an elites, and the elites had a special dance for the elites. Final maid from Webster is Miss Sue Weber, escorted by Larry Nisley. To be queen of the friendship dance is the height of social ambition at Webster Groves High. Only those in the leading crowd need apply. To be in the leading crowd, it is not essential to be a good student to get high grades. 83% of the 16-year-olds say so. Here's what they say is more important. To have a nice personality, to be a leader in activities, to be good looking, to have money and a nice car, and to come from the right family. The queen from Webster Groves is Miss Sue Weber. The student leaders, the football captains and the cheerleaders and the dance queens, are known in Webster Groves as Soshis. But if you're not a Soshi, chances are you're a normie and you feel left out. You may go to dances, but you don't help plan them. Or you may belong to the fringe, the wild ones, the weirdos, the intellectuals. It is, one student said to us, like everybody's wearing a tag around his neck. But it is an article of faith at Webster Groves High that the Soshis will inherit the earth. Everybody has substantial income. And every man comes home from his work about five o'clock, comes home, two kids maybe, two cars maybe, maybe some house pets. He'll come into his house and he'll say hello to all his kids. And this is, this is all the same almost throughout all Webster. Everybody comes out in step and they're all dressed the same and they all have the same ideas and they teach each other that what to think, what not to think. And and how to dress and just what to do and how to accept everything. That's one, two, one, two. And everybody comes out like that. Nobody comes out two, seven or 16, four or anything else, just one, two, one, two. In case you're curious, I wasn't an elite. I wasn't an outcast either. I became president of my school, but I didn't fit that elite's group of good looking athlete types. Uh, parents also rewarded those people. The schools rewarded those people. But I found out later when I did my television series on the 1960s, that when I interviewed people, although the elites looked like they were having it all together, in fact, inside, they, like most teenagers at that time, felt insecure, uncertain, uncomfortable, not what they're showing. Now, how did you become perfect as an elite? Well, part of it was you had to learn to dance. The waltz is the foundation of all good dancing. If you can dance a good waltz, you can dance any dance. So remember that. Get your partner's voice. Mrs. Condon's Dancing School. When they were younger, those of Webster Grove's 16-year-olds who are most carefully in step, and their parents too, for that matter, submitted to the polite formality of Mrs. Condon's. Mrs. Condon's is a lofty institution in Webster Grove's. Not every child who aspires to her classes is permitted entrance, but the youngsters of the privileged come here once a week because their parents want to assure that they become social successes. This, Mrs. Condon herself says, is one of the last outposts of civilized society. That's the, primarily what this work is for, to train them, I would say for formality and conventionality. They take that with them wherever they go. Where they go when they are grown is to the exclusive Monday Club, gowned and tuxedoed. The beat may sound faster, but it is still one, two, one, two.
Now let's look at looks, appearance. Teenagers have always cared about their looks, right? And they certainly cared about it in Webster Groves. But when they asked teenagers in this survey, what did you care most about? Was it looks? Nope. It was your car. Oh, well, it's uh, pretty important to have a car so you can go out and park and make out and all that ensues with that. Um, without that, you can't do anything because I'm sure the parents wouldn't want you to do that, especially with them. And besides, you know, it's not proper manners to sit in the back seat and heck when uh, they're driving you wherever you want to go. My car is just like a girlfriend to me because I spend my money on my car instead of going out and spending on girls. The most popular class in high school in Webster Groves was driver's ed. <laughs> Driver's education is the best-liked class at Webster Groves High. That's right. Always watch out for the driver who turns in the wrong lane. Are you Martha Brown? Yeah. Well, Martha, you passed the test. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just going to take a little more, more work on your part, son. I've accumulated two points, too many points. It's not a case of uh, any dangerous action on your part, but in, in other words, all your driving needs just a little bit more work on it. Obviously, these teenagers were going to college. College was a part of how you achieved success in society. 15% of the students were not planning to go to college, and we used to know them as the shop kids or the home ec girls. And in my world, that was about 50% of us were not going to college. But in this world, it was 15%. I wouldn't say it's all of them. There's a few in the school. You look down on the kids that take, for instance, shop. They look at it as if this kid can't keep up with the rest of the kids, he's stupid. He doesn't have the ability to take a math or a foreign language. And he resorts to picking up a real easy credit. He says, well, there's a way to pick up an easy credit, go down in a room and play around with a bunch of metal for an hour. But it's a lot different than that. You go down in a room and you don't play around with a bunch of metal. You come down here and you work. And Mr. Schrader sees that too. I mean, it's not as easy as it sounds, as a shop course. I get an accomplishment looking at something I built. I had to take pride in something I built. In the news every day in 1966, nationally, were civil rights demonstrations and other, the beginnings of student protests. Well, that didn't go in Webster Groves. Listen to these parents talking. Well, suppose to express their individuality, uh, one of your children um, took part in a civil rights demonstration uh, uh, downtown in St. Louis. So what would be your reaction to that? <sighs> I don't, like, I don't I think I'd like it either. Uh, I think some time before they'd sit down, I'll tell you that. <laughs> what? I, what? I can't see an excuse for it. What well, business is it of theirs? At 16 years old, they don't have any firm convictions yeah. of anything. I don't think any 16-year-old child should be burdened with the problems of the world. And all any normal child has to do is look at the demonstrators at Jefferson Bank. This was, so oh, what, uh, a year ago, I suppose. And a bunch of beatnik, white, black, green, yellow, everything. And most of them felt it. It looks like they pulled them out of some, out of some wine jug or something and put them out there to demonstrate. At 16 or 17 or 18, throw themselves into uh, concepts of, of racial prejudice or the haves and the have-nots. Uh, I think this is ridiculous. If you listen to the parents at that time, they are about control. They don't think much of the teenagers. They don't think they have a mind. They shouldn't be out of control. They should be controlled. In fact, the only person who reacts and says control ain't so good in Webster Groves is interestingly enough, their cop. These people have been regimented so much that they, they just don't know what self-reliance is, for the most part. There's so many musts in the family today where youngsters are concerned. Uh, youngsters must go to a certain dance or be invited to a certain party or belong to a sorority or fraternity. Uh, this is a must. They must wear the proper clothing. They're told where to go and when to go so often, and so much is done for them that, as I see it, a lot of these youngsters are... They, they're just not learning self-reliance at all. I'm sure you're asking yourself the question, what did these kids think about sex, these teens? Well, 75% did not believe in necking, they say. And 95% don't believe in sex before marriage. Uh -huh. All the studies show that isn't what happened. Kids did do sexual activities, maybe not as much as today, but more than they ever said, for sure. If it's someone I really like, 
I think on the first date, I would let him kiss me goodnight. But if it starts getting very serious all of a sudden, it's just, it doesn't work. I just say, forget it. And here's an interesting part of the survey. 55% of these teens said they believed a nuclear war would happen in America in their lifetime. Now, how did that affect them? This documentary doesn't look at that. So the documentary runs on national television in the prime time, and the people of Webster Groves sit around their homes and filmmakers film them as they're watching it. What did they think? People gathered in groups to watch all over town. The school board brought in television sets and watched in a body. Other sets were rented by the Masonic Temple. People with color sets held viewing parties. And Webster Groves, watching itself on national television, reacted in the most remarkable way. Some people literally laughed, some literally cried, and some became very angry. Only the message that I got was that this was a, a community of a bunch of spoiled brats and that the parents were, were even worse. And I don't believe it's true. This is not a true picture of Webster. A gross exaggeration. I think this was typical of all over. I mean, everybody's got cars and money and jobs on their mind. I mean, it's not just Webster. Actually, I'm not worried about what uh, we think of ourselves now. I'm, after this TV show, I'm just worried about what the rest of the country thinks yeah. about us. And I hope they don't get the impression that we're uh, too much snobbish. I mean, we may be snobbish a little bit, but heck, we haven't known that much else. They were made to appear much too materialistic. Kids 16 years old can't express themselves. I can't express myself. If you said, you know, what am I working for? What am I living for? What do I want out of life? I couldn't tell you. I don't think I came out looking very good. And matter of fact, I figure I am now the special guest villain on CBS's Answer to Batman. I just was so happy, I guess, to have a part in the show. I just. I felt like a television star or something. For the most part, the local folks hate it. Not all of them, but most of them. They feel it's unfair, unrepresentative of them, which means to me, they weren't looking at themselves. They were looking at how they looked to the outside world, and when you actually saw it, they weren't so comfortable with that. I'm going to try and find more clips from more documentaries from this time to broaden out what's on my YouTube channel regarding the 1960s the Baby Boomers. I hope you enjoyed Webster Groves, Missouri, 1966. David Hoffman, filmmaker, thank you.